Hi, I'm Brianna, and this is Decoding Physiology, a series from Decoding DX, where we focus on the pathophysiology of various clinical states and diseases, because we believe that if you understand the why, you'll learn for the long term and be able to make better decisions for your patients. This is part five of a multi-part series on metabolic alkalosis. If you haven't watched parts one through four, please go back and watch them first because they all build on each other. In this video, we're going to be talking about the state where you do not have a significantly reduced GFR, so GFR is above 40, or you've already addressed low GFR and ruled it out as the potential cause. We do not have a diuretic on board, and we have a volume down state in the body. In this context, there are a couple different causes that could create a metabolic alkalosis. But one of the easiest ones to think about is chloride-rich diarrhea. So think about that in the back of your mind as we're going through the pathophys to help yourself make sense of this process. To start off, we have to create the alkalosis. In a low volume state, we will have a physiologic increase in aldosterone because the kidneys sense the low volume and trigger the juxtaglomerular apparatus to release renin, which will go downstream and trigger the aldosterone. With elevated aldosterone in the intercalated cells of the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct, we will have hydrogen excretion and bicarbonate creation, leading to bicarbonate being pumped into the blood and hydrogen being pumped into the lumen. But there's another type of intercalated cell to be aware of. This is the intercalated type B cell, and it's very similar, but its function is more regulatory and compensatory. So its functions are essentially flipped from the intercalated type A cell. It will pump hydrogen into the blood and bicarbonate into the lumen. The intercalated B cell is one of the main ways that our body is able to compensate for an alkalosis by excreting extra bicarbonate. In the case of low chloride in the blood, so keep in mind that example of a chloride-rich diarrhea, so you're low volume and you're low on chloride. This will also lead to a low chloride in the urine because the urine comes from the filtrate and the glomerulus that ultimately just comes from the blood. So low chloride in the blood means low chloride in the urine. But this creates a problem because we need that chloride in the filtrate in the urine to be able to exchange for the bicarbonate. So if we don't have that chloride there, we're not going to be able to excrete that bicarbonate. And these processes are all intricately linked. So if we can't excrete the bicarbonate, that's going to cause a backflow, leading to an inhibition of the process of carbonic anhydrase, creating the bicarbonate and the acid to begin with. So this means that we're going to have less acid created and pumped into the blood. So in the low volume state with low chloride, we have high aldosterone, meaning that we're going to be creating the bicarbonate in the intercalated A cell, but we're not going to have enough chloride in the filtrate to be able to exchange for bicarbonate to help excrete some of that extra bicarbonate or to create new hydrogen to absorb to also try and balance out the extra bicarbonate with extra acid. So let's back up and go through that again. We have a low volume state, which is going to lead to a physiologic or normal high aldosterone state. The aldosterone is going to trigger the intercalated cell to create hydrogen and bicarbonate, which it will then send into its respective areas with the bicarbonate being sent into the blood Again, this is a new bicarbonate and the acid or hydrogen ion being sent into the lumen. Meanwhile, in the intercalated B cell, we normally would be able to exchange bicarbonate for chloride and create new acid to pump into the blood to help buffer the amount of extra bicarbonate that was created by the intercalated A cell. But in the state of having low chloride in the lumen, we're not able to exchange that chloride for the bicarbonate which will lead to a backup of the process and inhibit the production of new acid to be absorbed into the blood. So in the aldosterone state, we trigger an excess creation of new bicarbonate in the intercalated A cell. But because of the low chloride in the low volume state of the body, we don't have the delivery of chloride that we need to exchange for bicarbonate, meaning that we cannot create enough extra acid to help buffer the amount of extra bicarbonate produced earlier on in the process. And then we always have to have something going on to help maintain the alkalosis. Of course, there's the continuous process. If this process is pathologic going on and it just keeps going on, it's going to keep producing extra bicarb and our body's not going to be able to compensate. But we also will have a volume contraction state because we started off with the assumption that this was a low volume state. 
That's what triggered our physiologic aldosterone. And we know that a low volume state or extracellular fluid volume contraction will lead to the increased concentration of bicarbonate by simple fluid dynamics that we talked about earlier. If you have the same amount of solute and you take away some of the fluid, you're going to increase the concentration of that solute. We also, because of the low volume state, will have an increased absorption of sodium bicarbonate in the proximal convoluted tubule. This is related to the regulatory mechanisms of the kidney, where if we have a low volume state, it wants to reabsorb extra sodium. And along with a bunch of other ions, sodium is reabsorbed with bicarbonate in the proximal convoluted tubule. Here are our sources. I know that was a complicated episode, so please go back, take your time, and make sure you understand before moving on to part six. Part six will be our final episode of the metabolic alkalosis series, where we will talk about the effect of diuretic-induced metabolic alkalosis.